Well, good evening, and let me personally acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Gadigal people as well. well welcome to the Museum of Sydney, uh, the exhibition and this talk, which works best if you've seen the exhibition or you're going to see the exhibition. I'm not just going to represent it in a, um, a different way. And I want to cover four things for you this evening. One is how the exhibition came about how the potential content and coverage was narrowed down and what was left out. Um, this is the, the more and before in the title, as Sharon indicated in her introduction. And what does it all mean at the end of the day? So we can think about the future city in different ways, in science fiction, the dreams and fantasies of artists and writers, utopianism, or one step down from that, just thoughtful provocations about a better world through better cities. And there's a long history of that, driven by social and economic and environmental concerns. It's about selling a desired outcome as well, ambered claims often by both the public and the private sector for a preferred future, almost daring us to be outraged and then sort of pulling back into acceptable compromise. We see a lot of that lately. The nature of planning you know, is all about future strategies and scenarios and trying to pick the best one. It's the centre of the design process as well, a similar uh, everyday procedure of evaluation, refinement, rejection, replacement, selection. And maybe this process of selecting from alternatives, you know, weighing up the benefits and the cost is just a, a very human thing. Uh, we could probably tell the story of our own lives by the things that we didn't do. But when we think about the history of future landscapes, um, whose, the evolution is driven certainly by as much as what doesn't come true as does, and there's an awful lot that's unbuilt. This exhibition is completely unique, but it can be fitted into a genre defined by other exhibitions and books and sometimes both, so unbuilt Chicago, never built New York, unrealised Sydney seems to fit, does it not? One Sydney precedent for this was Eric Irvin's book from 1974, Dreams That Died on the Drawing Board, was its subtitle. This concentrates on the 19th and early 20th century, and it's a grainy, rather monochrome book of Buildings, bridges, memorials, statues, railway stations, parks. Some exhibitions have picked up on this before. Um, State Records did one in the early 1980s, although paradoxically I can't find any record of that. <laughs> uh, the City of Sydney, Powerhouse Museum, State Library. Uh, this museum have all sponsored displays or talks that have touched on the unrealised theme, but not quite in the focused and integrated way that this exhibition does. Uh, and it results really from a, an unsolicited proposal that I made in early 2019, not for me to you know, grab the limelight and curate it, but just it seemed like a sensible thing, a good thing for a Museum of Sydney to actually do. And the discovery of, of this model many years ago, sitting very forlornly in the corridor of a government building, um, has always stuck with me. It told me that this kind of artefact is, is part of a bigger story that will be of interest to a wider audience. And when I rediscovered it sitting in exactly the same place many years later, in 2019, um, I knew it had to be used somewhere and I'm very happy that it was actually picked up to be um, a rather um, centrepiece 
of the exhibition itself. So the museum people took a couple of years to make up their mind. Um, but from the time that they did want to go ahead, things really moved into being a collaborative venture. Uh, starting with translating a broad brush idea that I had into something that was going to work in practical terms. You know, what was the actual material that could be procured? Uh, where was it? Um, what quality did it have for exhibition? Um, there were many issues like this. Would people agree to lend um, material? How much did we need for what space was going to be filled? Um, how much was it all going to cost? So I've soon appreciated the complexities of putting something like this together and you know, um, came away in admiration for the professional team here at Sydney Living Museums for you know, the succession of um, always interesting public exhibitions that they put on for us as members of the, of the public. So in March 2021, planning began for the exhibition in, in earnest. And this is an early stab at the sections or themes which I saw as making up the exhibition. Uh, of these, only five of them, the highlighted ones, actually made the final cut. And that happened for, for different reasons. I've alluded to them already. Um, we needed a sharper focus. How were we going to define Sydney? What time period were we going to deal with? Um, and in turn, as the, the process got going, there were issues with what was available, um, what could be borrowed, how much it was going to cost. Was it copyright material or was it something that required other um, treatment? So I'm not going to deal with all the, the lost things the, of the original idea, because uh, bits of those do survive somewhere. But I'll, I'll, I'll start this evening in earnest with three of them in particular. Um, number two, the prehistory. Uh, number four, the ideas of Florence Taylor. And number six, the lost schemes of Harry Seidler. So the prehistory of an unrealised Sydney, of course, goes uh, way back. And there's no shortage of both official and unofficial schemes that never came true. Back here to the late 18th century. Indeed, Sydney is almost defined by what might have been from birth. Uh, not only if the British hadn't come um, or had the French beat them to it, um, but also with this very first city plan from July 1788 by William Dawes. The plan at right is a hypothetical, rather bleached out version of what might happen if that plan had been extended into a, a tartan pattern of gridiron blocks, perimeter buildings surrounding common open space. Of course, Sydney's development was much more makeshift than either of these plans convey. In terms of early architecture, it's a similar theme. Here's a design for a grand government house attributed to Francis Greenway, so taking us back to the Macquarie era. Um, and it captures that mood, that move, if you like, at that time towards a more permanent and prouder urban presence. Let me jump to the early 20th century and the Royal Commission on the improvement of Sydney and its suburbs in 1909, which recommended many infrastructural and aesthetic improvements. This scheme for Belmore Park opposite Central Station was an extraordinary statement for the era, uh, influenced by the grand Georgian presence of British cities, um, the dream of John Sulman. There's a whole narrative about various harbour crossings, both tunnels and bridges. Uh, here from 1922, Francis Stowe's three-legged bridge between Millers Point, Balmain and Waverton via Goat Island or Memel, as known by the Gadigal people. Not something that would be 
remotely considered today, or at least I hope not. <laughs> the Bradfield era brought an actual bridge, a city circle underground, you know, remarkable achievements for the time, still are, and also, however, dreams of an extended metropolitan system, and as we see here, a remodelled city of noble buildings and open spaces. Inspired by a visit to New York, Bradfield designed um, several big office buildings, which he called un giving unsurpassed views to flank and define the entrance to the Harbour Bridge. The Roaring Twenties, as they were called, was a peacetime decade of growth and optimism and produced many futuristic ideas. Um, here we see an alternate vision to Bradfield's Southern Bridge approaches that recalls the kind of schemes with towers and multi-level circulation systems being suggested for other cities at the same time. Visionaries were beginning to look at Sydney seriously in 50 years' time. This is by Norman Weeks, city surveyor for a time, uh, and also in the early 1950s, the chief town planner for New South Wales. The detail in the image is um, extraordinary. It's labelled Sydney's future airport. And bringing it up close, it turns out it's looking at Hyde Park, surrounded by skyscrapers, one of them growing out of St Mary's Cathedral, <laughs> bottom left, and with flocks not of seagulls or pigeons, um, but micro-personal aircraft um, ferrying people back to their high-rise apartments. So this transportation fixation continues into the post-war period, uh, and the exhibition picks up on, on that. You know, there are many projects that we could have included. Auto mobility, if I can co coin that term, you know, is, is the big theme here, both in the popular and the professional imagination. All of these schemes from 1947. First level pedestrian skyway system in the city centre. We get some of that later in the, in the 1960s. Uh, a freeway linking uh, all the eastern suburbs beaches and an underwater car park for the botanical gardens. <laughs> Merited consideration, said the city engineer at the time. One example of the industrial designer Charles Bovet's work from this time is captured in the exhibition. But here's another one of his schemes for an elevated tram network linking Central Station and Circular Quay. He called it the SOS, standing for Silent Overhead Service, um, with rubber tyres avoiding the, the usual clamour and clutter um, associated with this technology. Too much planning, even today, is obsessed by motor vehicles. Um, and that was particularly evident in this scheme when someone thought it was a good idea to demolish the Queen Victoria building <laughs> as being too old, uh, too ugly, too inefficient and replacing it with an underground car park. <laughs> so Florence Taylor was the second thematic focus that was, was cut. Only one of her schemes is featured. Florence was the first registered female architect in New South Wales, uh, better known as an editor of building, architecture and engineering journals, and she was the queen of improvement schemes from the 1920s to the late 1950s. She was very right-wing, a feminine feminist, um, with a remarkably successful business career. The centre of operations for many years was Loftus Street, not too far from where we are tonight, and her presence there is marked by some of the public art in the key quarter precinct. There don't appear to be too many of her original drawings left, and that's one reason why we didn't pursue her into the final exhibition. This plan looks like one of those originals. Um, most of her later work was done with collaborators. 
Um, inspired by New York's then recently opened Holland Tunnel, this is for a subterranean Martin Place for better traffic flow, underground parking, and is part of a, a bigger scheme that breaks through into the domain to create this grand eastern road entrance to the CBD through a new parliamentary building there um, with twin towers modelled on the, the Chrysler building in, in Manhattan and also intended to kickstart a residential redevelopment of the Woolloomooloo Basin. Many of Florence's schemes intersect with the themes and precincts of the exhibition. Um, circular Key, uh, an absolutely horrendous scheme of finger wharves, flyovers, underpasses and elaborate car parks, including that big lozenge-shaped thing at the right-hand side. The domain, um, reimagined as a semicircular sporting amphitheatre at the top, with additional buildings uh, clustered around the art gallery below, including um, a new museum and an opera house. And, you know, Florence looked further afield, a naval base, at Botany Bay, uh, a helicopter hub at Currajong Heights, an international airport on Pittwater. Um, <laughs> Replanning of Parramatta, you know, we should be glad that many of these did not come true. <laughs> this is a later scheme that one of the curators came across in the State Library. And it's in that Taylor tradition of kind of quirky improvements, uh, kind of adding up to something bigger than the sum of its parts. It's entitled A Solution to East Circular Quay and a Plan for the Enhancement of Sydney by the Learmont family in 1997. It was a little too large to, this is just one of the sheets, so a little too large to, to display in the, in the exhibition, but has some fascinating detail, which is probably why it ended up in the Mitchell Library. But unlike Florence Taylor's sort of development fetish, um, it's more about stitching together um, a more pedestrian city through walkways, plazas and other open spaces. There's an obsession with steps everywhere, apparently inspired by the 18th century Spanish steps in, in Rome. Plenty of new statues scattered around, most of them honouring colonial events. Big waterfront park on the left, anticipating Barangaroo, and below it in, with a pink perimeter, a, a, a big new commercial development, a promise of things to come. The scheme actually left Macquarie Street intact, um, but did propose a skywalk to all the way to King's Cross with railway underneath and pedestrians above. And it looked at roofing over uh, the Carl Expressway and bits of the beginnings of the Eastern Distributor um, for parks and playing fields. The third focus that didn't quite happen, although he is certainly represented in the exhibition, um, was Harry Seidler. Wanted to pick up him as a sort of representative spokesperson um, for sort of international modernism and its impact on the built environment in in Sydney. So here are six projects that are not in the exhibition that he was involved with. The McMahon's Point Urban Renewal proposal was designed to save the area from industrial development and delivered us Blues Point Tower in the process. This was really the first worked out and well presented urban renewal project of the era from the late 1950s and it very much set the pattern for what we see um, starting with the rocks in the unrealised Sydney exhibition. At Wright, an international trade centre proposed for um, the site of Luna Park with very distinctive sidler shaped buildings, continuing here into a rock scheme from the early 1960s, 
apartment blocks and on the right hand side a wave shaped building conceived as a counterpart to the sails of the Opera House, three circular quay in the 1980s. Planning for what became the MLC Centre led to some expressive shapes and a scheme on the right for a massive reworking of the CBD with towers and plazas marching all the way from Castle Ray Street down to York Street. And the general post office is lost somewhere in, uh, <laughs> in, this, uh, in this forestry. Sidelow clearly made a difference to, to Sydney. Um, but as we see here, he had even bigger plans. So what these three unrealised bits told us was to be more selective in our focus. We couldn't do everything. Uh, and so the exhibition concentrates on the time and space that's captured in this image. So it's you know, the harbour CBD in mainly the post-World War II years. So now I want to touch bases with um, all the featured precincts to pick up selectively on some of the things we didn't or couldn't include for various reasons. And, and one of these was visual quality. So some of the images coming up are, are working rather than exhibition quality pictures. Pre-World War II schemes which provided some sort of context or preamble, precedent, um, were largely not included, so I've snuck a few back into this presentation tonight. Let's start with the site we're on. You know, this was a very important um, colonial place and in the 1980s, when it was still, you know, um, a car park and temporary structures, there were two major competitive processes designed to arrive at an agreed solution. And that's covered in the exhibition, but there were two earlier schemes of note that we have a record of. This proposal was examined by a parliamentary committee in 1899. A six-storey sandstone building designed by the government architect, Walter Liberty Vernon, to house four government departments and a museum, no less, in the basement. The Committee um, recommended against the project until the government had done sort of due diligence about what office accommodation it actually needed to do, and so the scheme was dropped. This 1933 image from Florence Taylor's building magazine shows a proposed, although it looks much bigger, 12-storey uh, Art Deco style public building, also designed by the government architect, but 1933 was not a propitious time for putting forward such uh, expensive buildings. So I certainly, you know, had this idea of bringing the history of this site directly into the exhibition because it's quite an instructive scheme as well. Even Janet Lawrence's Edge of the Trees public art, you know, in the forecourt, you know, was chosen from a selected design competition. The Opera House. Uh, talk of a dedicated Opera House for Sydney for many decades before the 1950s. Actual plans of these are scarce, but here's one of them from 1934 for a site right at the top of Martin Place by Sydney architect Henry Hartridge, who after the war also successfully, unsuccessfully, enters the competition for the Anzac House competition, which is um, in our exhibition. The international design competition in the 1950s had you know, hundreds of entries, hundreds of unbuilt schemes, and unfortunately we don't have a comprehensive record of them because uh, they were sent back on request to um, the competitors. And the exhibition here you know, tries to bring together the best images of what we found survived. Harry Seidler's scheme is there in the revolving display of kind of monochrome boxes and uh, 
I'm sure the inspiration here is the David, what is now the David Geffen Hall in the Lincoln Centre in, uh, in Manhattan, which was being designed at the, at the same time. Seidler was very much his own man, as most of you would know, but becomes a very public supporter of, of Utzon in his sort of battles with the state government. The competition didn't really attract the, the cream of the world's star architects of the day, but two interesting competitors do stand out. Um, one of them featured in his black and white entry is the Austrian-American architect Richard Neutra, who's, who's best known for his streamlined international uh, luxury houses in Los Angeles. Um, this image, which I've secured just recently from his papers at the University of California, provides a colorized version of his entry with a small performance hall um, at the, uh, on the right-hand side and then a curved arcade round to the main opera theatre at the tip of Ben Long Point. Like Seidler, Neutra, disappointed he doesn't win, still becomes a, a very passionate supporter of Utzon's scheme. In fact, he knew Utzon and regarded him as a young friend from the time that Utzon had visited him in California. The other notable competitors, a duo, were Peter and Alison Smithson. Um, their names buried away as members of a larger British team and they are best known now as leaders of brutalist architecture. And they liken their design to a flower um, and the patterning of the ceilings to the scales of an armadillo. Um, there's also talk about a Chinese lantern being, a, a, uh, being invoked. It's at moments like these um, you begin to speculate on um, how these unrealised buildings might have changed architectural history, you know, the, the history of Sydney, um, certainly the careers of these designers. The original idea was to, for the exhibition was to deal with the CBD as, as a whole, that was too big. Um, so we kind of pulled it back to, to Macquarie Street with its own interesting proposal, certainly going back as far as the 1909 Royal Commission, part of a larger package of proposals, as you can see here, with new roads through the domain, clearing away the, the clutter around St James's Church, demolishing Hyde Park barracks to make way for new law courts and a bunch of other beautification works. And some of these ideas hang around as good things to do for decades. Here's a rough sketch from 1940, author unknown. Many schemes wanted to get rid of the Victorian era Sydney Hospital, which was designed by John Kirkpatrick, probably best known today as the architect of the old stands at the Sydney Cricket Ground. But rather than relocate the hospital to the suburbs or push it back into the domain. Um, this scheme ex reworks it and expands it on the site, but in the process taking out the um, historic mint building and of course Hyde Park barracks as well. 1940 scheme, um, building on the right, new law courts, an enduring fixation. Uh, and on the left, it was an optional. Could be a new parliament house, could be an opera house, um, could be a conservatorium. And in the middle, uh, a public square opposite <coughs> Martin Place. This is done by the government architect of the day, Cobden Parks, who was, believe it or not, the, the son of the 19th century premier, Sir Henry Parks. Um, a murky image of an important but um, unrealised 1945 scheme, Premier McKell, later a Governor General, had recently returned from a trip to South America and the United States and in, enthused by what he had seen in LA and Rio, um, he recounted to a reporter whole avenues and blocks 
reclaimed and demolished in tremendous modernization schemes. So that you know, was saying something of the values of the, the time picked up by many of the designers and accepted by um, the community as signs of, of progress. So we've got a big bell tower or Korean bordered by a, a national theatre, a new art gallery, and of course the unavoidable law courts. <laughs> There's a newspaper reproduction of this image in the exhibition. It was by the town planning branch of the Department of Local Government and its chief author was Nigel Ashton, who was later chairman of the State Planning Authority and a member of the Heritage Council. So this captures a larger plan at work to kind of you know, re rebuild a government centre worthy of sort of the late 20th century around Macquarie Street. Public square as a centrepiece, um, new parliamentary building and so on. Most problematic feature here was the high-rise tower, you know, which predates the state office block, which has kind of now disappeared in turn. But that was the most controversial element. And certainly, even in this scheme, though endorsed by government, uh, you know, begins to get pushed back from the community about, you know, we don't need tower here. Uh, you know, we don't want to compromise the domain. Circular Quay has a, you know, long history. It's a real hot spot for controversy and that continues to the present day. I'm not going to go way back, but John Bradfield's scheme from 1928 clearly points the way towards what we have now with both an overground railway and an elevated roadway. The opening sentence of the unreadable caption, um, probably written by Florence Taylor, says this. It speaks much for the ability of the Harbour Bridge and City Rail engineer that he can produce an architectural scheme of the above magnitude and merit at a third attempt. But many architects produce hundreds of sketches before being satisfied with the finished result. So to pick up on the theme of the exhibit. This scheme was pretty locked in, but you know, others surfaced. For example, um, this one, I'll, I'll let your eyes take it in, uh, you know, it's circular key at the left, um, by Emerson Curtis, an artist in 1938. In the 1920s, interestingly enough, Curtis had worked with the leading American architect planner Daniel Burnham, whose creed was make no little plans. Um, so this is Curtis's big plan and the essential idea is to move Circular Quay Station deeper into the city uh, to Bridge Street, open up the waterfront, put a covered walkway um, between them and for good measure throw in a completely remodelled rocks as you see there on the right hand um, side. City Council diligently received this uh, unsolicited proposal and you know, did a whole report on it but felt it was maybe a bit too expensive. At the waterfront, the Institute of Architects uh, tried desperately to ameliorate the likely engineering impacts of big transport infrastructure across the face of the quay with Professor Leslie Wilkinson here from Sydney University sketching this proposal inspired by Venice. There was an ongoing debate about the best architectural treatment once everyone knew that something was going to happen. So here we've got a, um, a contrast from the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald between a rather dowdy neoclassicism on the top and a kind of a lighter touch international modernism below. We jumped to 1964 and a real out there prospect by architect Bill Wheatland, who was an associate of Jörn Utzon. The Opera House here sits splendidly a hundred years hence on its uh, promontory, um, but the city behind has changed drastically uh, into futuristic, futuristic megastructures, parkland, public plazas, uh, all minus traffic congestion which is being ferried away in uh, freeways and um, parking stations. 
back to reality land, or, or is it, um, is this people, people mover proposal to solve the parking problems of the um, opera house, um, ferrying uh, customers in sort of lightweight overhead fiberglass gondolas um, <laughs> from near where the International uh, Ocean Terminal is to the opera house proper. That's from 1972. Picked up in the exhibition is the big concern from the 1960s of preserving a valley view across the face of Circular Quay with the AMP, the old AMP building on one side and what becomes Goldfield House uh, on, the, on, the, on the right or the western side behind the Carl Expressway. So this and other proposals for towers bang in the middle of the, the valley were, were very challenging to both the city council and the state government at the, at the time. They upset that, upset that sense of symmetry and helped prompt that drive for better controls uh, and alternative schemes later on. Um, such as this one by the architect Tony Roddy for the Keyhole Committee in the early 1980s, intended to replace any high-rise building south of the Carl Expressway and you know, in the middle. Um, here, delivering a bicentennial memorial park for a first fleet landing site. That's when we thought that's where the landing site was. Um, but in the process, as you see on the right-hand side, kind of recreating the shoreline of, uh, of the Gadigal lands. The Institute of Architects was very active in the 1980s, searching for ways forward, and this provocative grand triumphal arch was the work of three leading architects, then and now, Richard Laplastria, Peter Ireland and Ken Ma. It was, in a sense, taking any building out of the sensitive colonial site and um, site that would acknowledge, you know, the original um, inhabitants of the land uh, and, and, and pulling it out, sticking it perhaps a little uncompromisingly in the middle of a circular quay, but also delivering, you know, commercial spaces and a, and a, and a big rooftop um, uh, leisure space that would help pay its way. The Circular Quay, if you've seen the exhibition already, is kind of a subplot in the Circular Quay narrative. This was the Opera Garden Centre project, investigated by Len Lease, uh, promoted by Tom Forgan, the project manager. And this, I think, first drew the public's attention to the fact that was something was going on at East Circular Quay and the likely removal of the string of undistinguished early post-war buildings with either a new wall uh, or gobbling up all the floor space into a tall tower or, as we see in this scheme, a combination of, of both. The East Circular Key Ideas Competition in 1992 produced some interesting ideas and some, some clunkers. <laughs> uh, here's a single mega building designed to not dominate the Opera House unsuccessfully <laughs> and inspired by the funnel shape of cruise ships. The rocks west of Circular Quay, um, also a long history of unfulfilled schemes. Um, go back here to 1894 scheme by the engineer Norman Self in connection with a new harbour crossing involving creating a grand new railway terminal and new roads and uh, business premise sites. Self was Sulman's main rival for uh, establishing a futuristic vision for the city and he has another go in 1901 with a sweeping railway um, viaduct um, you know, around Observatory Hill and a lot of new street connections. Around the same time and with bubonic plague 
and death sparking a spate of demolitions, this grim barracks-like scheme uh, is also put forward. Product of a bunch of distinguished architects for the time, John Barlow, uh, George McCready, uh, and Varney Parks, who was the, an elder son of late Premier Sir Henry Parks. So from that, we can bound forward six decades to a similar courtyard configuration. This is an impressive perspective as an uh, aesthetic statement um, for an entry that's not in the exhibition for the 1962 competition by Melbourne architects Grounds, Romberg and Boyd. The image used to promote this talk on the museum's website was theirs, and this is an alternate scheme that didn't get too much publicity. It features Roy Grounds' like of things uh, cylindrical and Robin Boyd's sort of streamlined modernism, um, which he so famously advocated in his book, The Australian Ugliness. It was one of several Lend-Lease schemes commissioned, and interestingly enough, they also went after Jörn Utzon, who did not enter, but that would have been a, a great scheme to look at now, had he entered. The 1970 rock scheme was very unpopular because of those plans for high-rise north of the Carl Expressway, meaning a real battering for the heritage and community fabric. But you could see it coming. So Bates, Smart, McCudgeon provided the architectural input for that 1970 scheme. And they were responsible for the so-called grey ghosts at RMIT in, in Melbourne in 1965. And this form of anonymous towers was similarly foreshadowed in the scheme for uh, UTS in 1968, of which we got one tower, but not the whole forest of them. So all these things have a kind of prehistory preamble. Victoria Street, Woolloomooloo. So Victoria Street in Potts Point, overlooking the Woolloomooloo Basin, was within the state government's redevelopment area that's covered in the exhibition in the late 1960s. And it becomes a real battleground between uh, the developers, the Askin Liberal government, the community, the Builders Labourers Federation, squatters and the police. This is where Juanita Nielsen disappears in 1975. So it's not really dealt with in, in the exhibition because we couldn't readily find quality exhibition material. Wendy Bacon's oral commentary, if you've got time to listen to it, uh, helps fill the gap. But it was these three proposed towers by Petal Thorpe in the image of a trio of Australia squares um, that, that really began to spark alarm bells. Uh, when they were howled down, um, Ken Woolley a distinguished architect obliged with this new scheme, a gigantic stepped apartment complex for the developer. This was supported by the National Trust, but still opposed by the Victoria Street Resident Action Group and remained unrealised. But this clash between developer, community and architect um, is captured in not one, but two cinema release films um, soon after, some of you might remember them, The Killing of Angel Street by Donald Crombie and Heat Wave, directed by Philip Noyce and starring Judy Davis. In Heat Wave, the architect's dream project, which was called Eden, um, directly invokes the, the Ken Woolley scheme. Down on the flats behind the Finger Wharf in Woolloomooloo, after the high-rise commercial towers had been seen off, the Housing Commission in 1976 invited a number of leading architects, including John Andrews and Philip Cox, to prepare alternative schemes for more um, affordable and social housing. So community comment via consultation belatedly becomes the order of the day. This scheme was said to be based on traditional London squares, but looks a little like that barracks scheme from the rocks in, in 1900. Were there more time and space in the exhibition, we might have taken the Woolloomooloo story further. You might remember the plan to get rid of the Finger Wharf in the 
80s, kind of unbuilt, unrealised. Paul Keating, who has sort of selectively insinuated himself into high-profile Sydney design debates through the years, wasn't a fan, felt it sterilised Woolloomooloo Bay. So the environmental impact statement that was done um, for its removal envisaged a, a new 400 berth marina, um, perhaps an alternate privatisation of blue space. It's um, prevented by Green Band, prevented by the rallying of the Friends of the, the Finger Wharf group. Interesting image here, sort of airbrushes out the whole naval complex um, on, on Garden Island. Um, this one does as well, but deliberately, uh, a speculative project from 2017 for the Urban Task Force, a, a Sydney kind of property uh, lobby group. The idea being to explore a post-naval future of, of housing, cultural buildings, um, heritage sites and so on. The final site I wanted to, to cover, um, Darling Harbour, also has an interesting prehistory, but compressed into a rather short period in the 1980s. When Labor Premier Neville Rann, inheriting this kind of clapped out precinct, uh, envisaged it as a site for a World Expo in 1988. Feasibility study was done in 1980 by a joint Commonwealth State Task Force evaluating a number of possible sites and um, Darling Harbour was recommended, recommended as a feasible one to, as you see, crowd in a whole bunch of pavilions, auditoriums and car parks. This was the project that was eventually lost to Brisbane for its South Bank Expo. So we had to find something else to replace it. In 1981, the celebrated American landscape architect Lawrence Halperin convened a big workshop with over 120 people to sort of brainstorm ideas. And coming out of that was the notion of Darling Harbour as a people place that would not have high rise development. Um, although others disagreed with that vision. Um, Ian Yates was a, a, um, a businessman, ran a security company and owned a, a big slab of Darling Harbour, most of which otherwise was in state ownership. And his scheme was for all sorts of commercial towers, floating restaurants, cable cars. The state government, you know, went through um, a process of evaluating different schemes. This came out of the Premier's Department in 1983. Strong educational precinct uh, on the left, probably rehousing UTS. Um, Harbourside, Marina and a relocated Paddy's Market. The International Village adjacent to Ha, to, uh, sorry, to Piermont Bridge was a state government favourite in rather late official plans until it got knocked out. It was to comprise buildings from different countries designed by architects from those countries to showcase um, multiculturalism, food, artefacts and so on. And there would be a 200 room hotel which is down there where it says New South Wales State Records the, where the report um, that this image comes from was sourced. So the Darling Harbour Authority sought expressions of interest for this international village and the winner was Sir Peter Abels who was then running Ansett Airlines at a time when it was transitioning from purely domestic carrier into an international carrier and so he saw something in this scheme for him but it didn't work. However, his consolation prize and our perhaps booby prize was that he got through his company TNT the contract for installing the monorail. <laughs> One of the iconic images for this exhibition is of Discovery Village. This was one of the last pieces of the Darling Harbour puzzle on a site south of where the freeways cross it and fronting a harbour inlet. Um, 
this was seen as a electronic entertainment zone dominated by that huge spherical circle vision theatre offering sort of 360 degree projection. The scheme fell over when the financial fortunes of its main backer, the Perth-based later disgraced businessman Kevin Parry, got into financial difficulties. But the legacy of this idea you could see being traced through to the Sega world and the IMAX theatre, which in turn have been swept away, away by more recent redevelopment. The most flamboyant fantasy land was uh, Project Sunrise, not to be confused with Alan Joyce's uh, non-stop flights to uh, the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> Here the main inst inspiration was Disney's Epcot Centre in Orlando, Florida. Epcot, standing for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. So the aim was a participatory, high-tech um, uh, educational, technological experience. And so there's an oceanarium, there's an adventure park, there's a movie world, there's an Aboriginal sacred cave. Um, there's hotels, office spaces, educational facilities, exhibition centre, conference centre, waterfront housing, retail precincts inspired by Venice and Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. Um, all, all too much to bear, but probably reminding the state government that there could be a fun element in what Darling Harbour became. The submission is forms part of the exhibition here. You can see it sort of digitised, changing pages. Um, and there are some you know, very interesting artistic visualisations in them. Some of them are not great quality, but there are several that are cut above. And these are the work of the British artist Roger Dean. So this is his Piedmont Bridge uh, as an electronic community of tomorrow. So this is very much at the dawn of the, the computer and the internet age. Towers, these sinuous structures, mushroom-like domes as well. Here's another view of the, the Piedmont Bridge on the, on the right and on the left, the sort of Discovery Fun Park, described as a digital Tivoli Gardens after Copenhagen's famous amusement park. If the surreal enthusiasm here looks familiar, it's because Roger Dean, probably best known for the many album covers he did in the <laughs> 1970s. The curious thing, though, is where did all this capital come from, you know, to invent this incredible scheme? Uh, the backer was an interface spiritual group um, called Sabad, which is still around, um, founded by an Indonesian. And it has attracted some high-profile adherents, and to keep with the musical theme, one of them was Roger McGuinn, the founder of The Birds. They were looking for a, a site for their world conference in 1988 and hit upon the idea of redeveloping Darling Harbour and then handing it over for the bicentenary at the same time. The key front man, and I'm grateful to, to Graham Crawford for this information, was Murray Clapham. He was a global director of Subud and I understand the main financier of Project Sunrise. He was Indonesian based, former diplomat, turned investment advisor, played one game for North Melbourne in the VFL, race course owner, uh, needless to say had very good labour connections at the time but not good enough to get this um, up and running. Even more intriguingly is that when Subud eventually did come to Sydney in 1989, um, the focus for their Congress was far more humble with a series of tents on the... <laughs> on the uh, gardens of Sydney University. So to conclude, I've been through how the exhibition came about, how we narrowed it down, what more we could have included from before and, and during our time period. So what does it all mean? Um, well, I, I guess that's up to you guys to, to think about that. 
Um, what if is a kind of good question to sometimes ask, I think. Um, if nothing else, it's an interesting way of sort of musing over what might have been in even Sydney's relatively recent past within living memory and how it wasn't all seamlessly predetermined but very much contingent on, on circumstances. It might get you recalling other projects that I've missed out or you know, come from places that you've been involved with or near where, where you live. I have to give a, a sort of a shout out here to um, this blog site, Sydney Flashbacks, um, which is a, um, a terrific source of information. I only discovered it uh, along the way with our research for this exhibition. And it covers the sort of serious um, public and private developments that, uh, that we do, but goes out into the suburbs as well. But as I said at the beginning, futuristic visions come from many different sources, sometimes not as worked out as practical schemes, more provocative projects to sort of have us think about the city we want. Layla Stanley's Native Networks is in that category, joint winner of the Architecture Australia Unbuilt Prize for 2022. And it gets us thinking about ecology and conservation and green spaces. And it's sort of dreaming of this habitat corridor from Circular Cree to St Peter's. I think the exhibition contributes to a, a genre of what we might call history of the future. As I read down this list, you know, we learn about the times in which um, projects were conceived, better understand them, some of the backstories that I've tried to share with you in this talk. And I'm conscious as I've been talking of the strong American influences that we can see in Sydney design circles from um, the early 20th century. You know, there are moments that are kind of make or break, critical junctures along the way. We get to understand a little bit more about the agendas and methods of developers, um, government and other stakeholders. And I think also we begin to think not only of the past but the present and the future and the choices that confront the community. The unrealised exhibitions for other cities mentioned at the beginning are very architectural and so too is this exhibition unavoidably and there are plenty of schemes that we could have put in. Um, I'm underlying the point by this one for Darling Harbour a good 10 years before the competition that we cover in the, in the exhibition. But a distinctive theme I think of what Sydney Living Museums have done here is the social dimension. In particular, the power that the community has to summon up critiques, to modify or even scuttle entire projects um, because of their unpopularity. And there are many instances of that in the exhibition and it's an empowering theme for all. I think it's captured very well in this great photo from the early 1970s showing famous author Patrick White in the Beret uh, and others outside the Sydney Town Hall protesting the plan for a, a new Olympic stadium that was proposed for bang in the middle of Centennial Park. So, I mean, as we move from the city that might have been, which is what the exhibition's all about, to the Sydney that might be, things suddenly get serious um, and, and we confront the same sort of challenges perhaps as earlier generations did in questioning contemporary developments. There are now better processes for dealing with that but no guarantees of the um, outcomes or success. And indeed in some ways, and maybe it's a great paradox of this whole exhibition and this talk, is that in some ways you might wonder you know, whether in fact very much has changed um, at all. Uh, at that point, I'll end, and I thank you very much for your uh, attention this evening. <laughs>